All right, guys, we are now going to move on to section 1.2. Section 1.2 is titled Basic Classes of Functions. So in section 1.1, we reviewed what a function is, and we talked about like function notation, we talked about domain and that kind of stuff. So now we are going to talk about basic classes of functions. First thing is we're going to going to do a definition. This is a very, very important term we are going to um, do right here. This is going to be a term we use throughout this entire class, especially in chapters three and four. Okay, so this is a big one. This is a term I'm sure you have heard at some point in time, but I want us to talk about what it really is, okay? So what we're going to say is we're going to say consider a line, which I'm just going to call L, okay? Consider a line named L, and it's passing through two points, and those are going to be the points x1, y1, and x2, y2. So this is just two random points, okay? x1, y1, this just means the first point, and then x2, y2, this is just some other point, okay? <clears throat> the slope of that line, which we called L, is the numerical representation of the change in y with respect to the change in x. So the slope of the line tells me how does y change as I change the x, okay? That's what the slope is, that's what it's going to tell me. How does y change as I change the x? So really what this is, is that this is a rate of change, okay? I wanna know how does y change as I change the x? This is a rate of change. Keep that in mind. When I have a straight line like what this says, a line, a straight line, so like I'm just gonna draw a random line, straight line. The slope is going to be the same throughout this entire line, okay? The change in y with respect to the change in x is going to be the same throughout that entire straight line, okay? As we will see as we move on to chapters 3 and 4, whenever I have a curve, it doesn't always stay the, 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 the same, okay? But for now, with straight lines, my slope is always going to be the same across this whole straight line, okay? But one more time, I want to make this very clear. The slope is a rate of change, okay? It is the change in y with respect to the change in x. Okay, the slope is given by the formula, and here it is. We always use m for our slope. Um, the French word for slope is something that starts with M, and so that's why we we um, we use the M right here. But M equals y two minus y one over x two minus x one. So that's why I needed my two points right right here. It's the change in y, so y two minus y one, which would to tell me how I'm gonna change the, the y, divided by x2 minus x1, because that is my change in the, the x, okay? Again, it's change in y over change in x. How does y change as I change the x? That is going to tell me what my slope is, okay? One more time, I'm gonna even put like a star right here. Slope is the rate of change. We're gonna use this fact a lot throughout this class, okay? 
So before we practice finding what the slope is, there are a few more things about straight lines I want to know. Specifically, I want to know how to write the equation of a straight line, okay? There are actually three ways to. We're going to do all three of them. There are three, right, the, three ways to write the equation of a, a line. The first way is using what's called point-slope form. And point-slope form is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. In this case, m is the slope. As we said, we always use m for slope. And the point x1, y1 is a known point. So the point here is that if I know a point on my straight line and if I know what the slope is, I can write it in point-slope form. That's why it's called point-slope form. Because if I know a point and I know the slope, I can put it in this format right here. Okay, So that's point-slope form. Again, it's a known point. So if I know one point on the, the straight line, a known point and my slope, I can plug them in, okay? Another way to remember this, it's y minus a y that I know, and then over here it's my slope times x minus an x that I know, okay? Because this is a known point. From point slope form, once I have it in point slope form, I can change it into another form, slope intercept form. This is the one you've probably seen the most in your life simply because it looks really neat and um, it isn't hard to draw the graph from this form. This form is y equals mx plus b where of course m is our slope as it always is, and b is the y-intercept. We reviewed how to find that in section 1.1, right? <clears throat> Again, this one is very nice because it isn't hard to, to um, draw the graph because this b right here tells me where I'm gonna cross the y, so it's gonna be somewhere on here. That's my b. And then I can use my slope to find what 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 my next point is, right? And so that's why we really like that that the that form here because it tells me a lot of stuff. From that form, I can transform it into our third and final form, which is standard form. And standard form looks like this. Standard form is ax plus by is equal to c, okay? The key points about here is that x and the y are both on the left side over here. The constant is over here on the right side, okay? So x and y are on the left side, c is on the right side, okay? Now, it isn't that clean, right? There are some uh, rules here I've gotta do. The first rule, is that A is always positive. We have to make sure our A, which is our first term right here, is always positive, okay? Another rule is that there can be no fractions. And so as we work th through these, I will show you how to make sure that happens, okay? So these are the three forms I'm gonna do. And now that I know what slope is, and now that I know how to write the equation of a line, let's practice with that, okay? Let's practice with slope and writing the equation of a line. Example. Consider the line Passing through the points, let's do 11, negative 4, and negative 4, 5. We're going to find the slope of this line and write the equation in all 
three forms. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing it says right here is to find what the slope is. And so I'm gonna do that to start with. Remember, slope is my change in y divided by my change in the x, okay? So slope, which we said was m equals, to find what my change in y is, I'm gonna do y2, which is five, right? My y for the second point, so five, minus y1, which is my y for the first point, so minus negative four, over, and then I want to divide that by the change in the, the x. So negative 4 minus 11. And so now I'm going to work that out, okay? Again, it's my change in y divided by the change in x. So how does y change over how does the x change? So on top, we have 5 minus negative 4, which is like saying 5 plus 4. So that's 9 divided by negative 4 minus 11 is negative 15. So 9 over negative 15, we can write that, uh, that. That can actually reduce. Both of those have a factor of 3. And so I can write that as negative 3 over 5. So my slope is negative 3 over 5. What this means as a slope is that as my x changes by 5, my y is going to decrease by three. That's what that means. As my x goes up by five, my y is gonna go down by three, okay? All right, so now that, now that we have found our slope, I can write the equation of the line, okay? So first things first, I have my slope and I have two points. Since I have a point and a slope, I wanna use point slope. Okay, we are gonna use point slope form first, which remember we said was this format right here. Point slope form first. Um, it does not matter which point we pick, you will get the same thing no matter what. Okay, so just pick one of these, it doesn't matter. I'll just pick the first point, okay? So using this first point, remember it's y minus a y that I know, I know y equals to the negative four, equals my slope, which we just found to be negative three-fifths, times x minus the, the uh, uh, x that you know, the x we know is 11. That is point slope form. You could actually write this one, um, one more step down by saying since this is y minus a minus four, you could write that as y plus four, but it doesn't matter. This is point slope form. So that's the first way. From there, we are going to turn it into slope intercept form. If you notice on how that form is, it's solved for the y, right? All I have over here is a y. So to turn it into this form, I'm just gonna solve this for, for the, the y, okay? So first things first, distribute my slope. So y plus four equals negative three-fifths x. Negative three-fifths times negative 11 makes it positive. Three times 11 is 33 over five. Then to solve that for the y, just subtract four. So we end up with y equals negative three-fifths x. Now I've got to do 33 over five minus four, so let's do that. I'm going to write it as 4 over 1. We need a common de denominator, which would be a 5, right? So we're going to multiply by 5, multiply by 5. So 33 over 5 minus 4 times 5 is 20, so 20 over 5. So then I can just do 33 minus 20, which is 13. So plus 13 over 5. This is slope intercept form. Again, because I have solved it for the y. So now that I've got it in that form, now I can put it into standard form, okay? Remember we said standard form is cool because x and y are both on the, the left side, right? 
So I want to move the x over there with where the y is. So I'm going to add 3 fifths x. So that's going to give me 3 fifths x plus y equals 13 over 5. And to check and make sure it's in standard form, I'm going to look at what the rules say. The first things first is that the a has to be positive. I look right there, and we're good there. That That is positive 3 fifths, so that's good. But rule number two says it can't have any fractions, right? I do. I have 3 fifths right here and 13 fifths there. So to get rid of the, fr the fraction, since they're both over a 5, just multiply the whole thing by 5. Okay? So what happens there is on my first term, 5 times 3, ah, sorry, 5 times 3 divided by 5, the 5s are going to cancel out. So this first term is just 3x. 5 times y is 5y. And then 5 times 13 divided by 5, 5s will cancel out again. So that's equal to 13. That is standard form. So that is how I find the slope, and that is how I write the equation of a line. Okay. Um, I said this on the 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 last one, but I just want to say it again. Remember, the good thing about this not being a live class is that like you can pause it and you know rewind and all of that stuff. And so, if any of that does not make sense, feel free to like hit pause or to rewatch it. And of course, please contact me if anything does not make sense. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Let's do another example doing the, the same thing. I'm going to do the same thing. The reason I really want to make sure we know how to do this is because we are, are going to do something like this in chapter th um, three. Okay, so I want to make sure we have this down um, because we are going to need it over there. Okay, we're going to do the same thing. So I'm not going to rewrite all that, but we're doing the same thing. For the two points, negative 3, 2, and 1, 4. Okay, we're going to do the exact same thing. So then we are going to find what the slope is and then write the equation of the line in all three ways. Okay. So first things first, let's find what the slope is. So remember we said to find our slope, it's the change in y divided by the change in the x. So change in the y is 4 minus 2. Change in the x is 1 minus negative 3. 4 minus 2 is, of course, 2 over. That's like saying 1 plus 3, and 1 plus 3 is 4. I can reduce that to be 1 half. So our slope is going to be 1 half. Again, what this means is that as I change my x by 2, y will go up by a 1. Again, as I change the x by 2, y will go up by 1. That's what that means, okay? Okay, so now, let, so now let's write the equation of this thing. Notice I have points and I have a slope, and so that's point-slope form. Uh, just like I said on the last one, I can pick whichever point I, uh, I, I want. I will get the same thing no matter what. I like to always pick the, the first point, but... That doesn't matter. Just pick either one of them. It doesn't matter. You will get the same thing once you get down to standard form. Okay, it'll be the same thing. So point slope form we said was y minus the y that I know. So y minus 2 equals my slope, which is 1 half, times x minus the x that I know. Since that's minus negative 3, that's like saying plus 3. That's point slope form. So now for the next form, I have to solve this for the y, okay? So to do that, distribute our slope, so 1 half times both of those. y minus 2 equals 1 half x plus 1 half times 3. I could just write that as 3 halves. I've still got to add 2 to solve it for y, so add 2, add 2. I get y equals 1 half x. And now I've got to do 3 over 2 plus, I'll write that as 2 over 1. A common de 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 denominator there is 2, so times 2 times 2, 3 over 2 plus 2 times 2 is 4, so 4 over 2. So now i just got to do 3 plus 4, which is 7. 
so plus 7 over 2. Now that I have it solved for the y, I know that is slope, it, intercept, form. So then my last form is standard form. Remember we said standard form, that's whenever x and y are both on the left side. So I want to move 1 half x over there. So minus 1 half x minus 1 half x. That gives you negative 1 half x plus y equals 7 over 2. I've got to make sure I follow both of the rules we have for standard form, and that is A has to be positive. I can see here it's not. So to make it positive, I have to multiply everything by a minus sign. But we also said I can't have any fractions. I have over 2 and over 2, so I have to multiply it also by 2. So again, since I have a minus sign out front, I have to multiply by it. And then I want to get rid of the fractions, and so I'm going to multiply it also by 2. So now I do it. Negative 2 times negative 1 half is positive 1. So that's going to be 1x. Negative 2 times a y is going to be minus 2y equals negative 2 times 7 over 2 is negative 7. And that is standard form. <coughs> Again, this is a skill we are going to need. And so that's why I wanted to make sure we had this down. <clears throat> All right, so now that we have talked a little bit about lines, let's talk about more common function types. Definition. This is a term we're going to hear a lot in here and throughout all math. Definition. A polynomial function is a function of the form. This is going to look really bad. It always looks bad and it scares students and everything, but I promise it isn't that bad. It just looks bad. But the form is f of x equals a sub n, which means a with a small n, times x to the nth, plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the power of n minus 1, plus a sub n minus 2 times x to the n minus 2, and that pattern is going to continue on all the way down to a sub 2 times x squared, plus a sub 1 times x, plus a sub 0. So again, this looks really bad. This just looks wrong, right? But let me explain to you what this is, okay? a n is just a number. So it's a number times x to a thing up here. And that's how every single term is. This is just going to be a number times x to 1 less than what that, 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 that was. So if I started with x to the 8th, I could go x to the 7th, x to the 6th, x to the 5th, x to the 4th, x to the 3rd, down to x squared, x, and then a constant. Okay, That's what this means. Okay, Again, it looks really bad, but I promise it is not. It's just a number times x to a power, okay? n, this n right here, n, which is the highest power, is called the, the degree. Is called, sorry, I skipped a word. Is called the degree. The highest power is called the degree. To degree. Once again, the highest power is called the degree. If the degree is 2, so if n is equal to 2, if the highest power is 2, so x squared is the highest term, it's called quadratic. I guarantee you've heard that term somewhere in life. Quadratic means my highest term is x squared. If the degree is 3, so if the highest power is 3, 
It's called cubic. <clears throat> there are certain there, there sorry there are certain terms for for if x is equal to four or if x is equal to five and on and on but they're not really used a whole lot and so like we're not gonna go through them but um the the main ones is if the degree is two it's quadratic if it's the three it is cubic so the good thing about this is knowing what the degree is and knowing what value is out front right here, knowing just those two things can tell me a lot about the graph of this guy, okay? It can tell me a lot. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about that. So we're, this is the behavior of the graph at infinity. So what this means is as x gets really big, which means as I go really far to the right side, or as I get really small, what happens? That's what I want to know, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So first things first. If the leading coefficient, and by that I mean the number attached to the highest power, okay, the number right here, a n, the number attached to the highest power, if that is positive, then as x approaches infinity. I wrote it like this because this is how we are going to read it throughout Cal 1, okay? As x approaches infinity, which means as x gets really big, which means as the graph goes really far to the right, that means f of x also approaches infinity. So if the number out front is positive, then as x gets really big, y also gets very big. What this means in terms of the graph, as x gets really big means as I go really far to the right, my y gets really big. So I'm pointing upwards like that. That's what that means. On the flip side, if the leading coefficient is negative, you can probably guess what that means. If it is negative, this should say as, then as, <clears throat> then as x approaches infinity, meaning as x gets very big or as my graph gets really far to the right side, f of x is going to get really small, which means it's going to go to negative infinity, which in terms of the graph means as x gets really big, which means as x gets really far to the right, y is going to point downwards. So if the number out front is negative, it's going to point down. That's what this means. So that's how I know what happens on the right side. This is how I tell what happens on the left side. If the degree, and that means if the highest power if the degree is even, so 2, 4, 6, 8, blah, 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 then the behavior as x approaches negative infinity, which means as x gets really small, which means as x goes really far to the left, it is the same as when x approaches positive infinity. Entity. So if the de de degree is even, the two sides do the, do the same thing. So if I already know from my first two steps, if I already know as I go far to the right, I go up. If the degree is even, this means on the left side, I do the same thing. Okay. Whereas if I know on the right side, I'm pointing down because that's what I found. Then on the left side, I also point down. 
It just means they do the same thing. On the flip side of that, if the degree is odd, the behavior is the opposite. <clears throat> so what this means is if I already know on the right side I point up, this means on the left side I point down. Whereas if I already know that on the right side I point down, then on the left side I must point up. That happens if the degree, which one more time is the highest power, if that is odd, they are not the same. So if the right side points up, I know my left side must point down. If the right side points down, I know my left side must point up. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at some examples of using this as well as some stuff we learned in section 1.1 1 to draw some very basic graphs. So example. Let's let f of x be equal to x cubed minus 3x squared minus 4x. And I have several things I want to do. <clears throat> Step A says, uh, sorry, I lost my place. One second. Describe. Okay, guys, so sorry about that. There was a little pause in there. I don't really know what happened, but whenever I got to right here, my laptop said cannot move on or some kind of stuff. And so anyway, I think I figured it out, and so I'm going to try to restart where I stopped. Okay, so what I said right here was we are going to let the function be x cubed minus 3x squared minus 4x, and the first part that I want to do is describe the behavior of the graph. As x approaches infinity and as x approaches negative infinity. So this is what we just have written down on our last board. So the first one we can do is as x gets really large, right? What we said there was that if the leading coefficient is positive, which it is right here, right? Because our highest power here is the 3 and the value out front is positive so what we said there when the leading coefficient is positive then the function is going to get very large right so from what I wrote down right here I can tell that as x approaches infinity f of x does as well Again, I know that because the number out front is positive. That's why I, I, I know that. So now I want to know what happens as x gets really small. What happens there? Well, as we have written down, I need the degree to know that, right? Remember that, that the degree is the largest power, right? In this case, it's 3. Our highest power is 3. So our degree is 3. As I wrote down over here, if the degree is odd, which that is, then the behavior is the opposite. So, since right here, f of x got really big, since it is odd, this is going to get very small. So what this means in terms of the graph, this first line means as I go far to the right side, it's going to go up. So I'm going to point up on the right side, and then as I go really far to the left, it's going to go down. That's what this means right here. Okay. Part B, what I want is I want to find the zeros. We talked about that in section 1.1. Okay. To do that, remember we let y be equal to 0 and solve it for x. So we have 0 equals x cubed minus 3x squared minus 4x. We have to go back to our skills on how to solve these things for x. As I can see right here, every one of these has an x, right? There's an x there, there's an x there, there's an x there. So we can factor out an x, so x times. That would leave us with x squared minus 3x minus 4. 
what a lot of people try to do is they say, oh, everything right here has X, right? Because I have X, X, and X. So they, so what a lot try is they say, let's divide it by X. It doesn't work like that because as we are going to see, what probably will happen then is I'm going to get X is equal to zero. So if I divide it by an X, I'm dividing it by zero, which I can't do that. And so that's why I can't just divide it by X. I have to factor out X, okay? So now that I've done that, let's factor this guy out. I need the factors of negative four whose sum is equal to negative three. So that's going to be X minus four and X plus one. So now that I have that all done, set each factor equal to zero. X equals zero. X minus four is zero. X plus one is zero. Solve each of those for, for X. The good thing is this one is already done. For this one, we're going to add 4, and we get x equals 4. This one, x is equal to negative 1. So this, that is going to tell me where the graph crosses the x-axis. So now that I know what happens when I go really far to the right and really far to, to the left, and where I cross the X, I can actually use that to draw a rough sketch of the graph of this thing, okay? So I'm going to do that. So first thing I know is as I go really far to the right, I point up. And as I go really far to the left, I point down. So when you're drawing the graph, just make sure that that happens. Let me erase this from my previous class. So like we said, we know it goes really far up as I go far to the right and far down as I go to the left. We also know I'm going to cross the x at x equals 0, x equals 4, and x equals negative 1. So let's mark that. x equals 0, x equals 4, and x equals the negative 1. So now I'm going to use all of that to draw a very rough sketch, okay? So I know on the right side, I point up. So I know I'm pointing up over here. I know that much, which means I'm going to go through this point. I have to come back up to, the, to this point at some point and cross it. And then I have to come back down to this point, which is going to make me go down, which is what I wanted, right? We said I go down. So this is just a very rough sketch, okay? A very, very rough sketch. One of the big things we are going to do in chapter four is learn how to draw a very exact sketch, okay? Because right now, I don't know how to, to tell how far down I'm going to go, right? I don't know how to tell how far down this goes. I don't know how to tell how far that goes up. We just don't know it yet, right? And so for now, though, this is just a very rough sketch because I know as I go to the right, I point up and I've got, I've got to cross at these three points here. So if I'm pointing up, I know I have to go through this point, back through this point, back through this point, and then go down, which again, I know that, that, that right? Because that's what we had said over here. So that's just a very rough sketch, All right? So like I said, we are going to do a lot more of that, 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 that kind of stuff as I move through the class, but that's just a very brief review of how I draw a very rough sketch, okay? Again, if any of that does not make sense, you can pause, rewind, or talk to me, and I will be happy to, to help out, okay? The last thing we are going to talk about in section 1.2 is we are going to review how to draw a graph using transformations, okay? Talk about transformations of functions. I want to talk really quick about what I mean. So when I talk about transformations, what this means is I'm going to take a graph that I already know, right? A very common one. So like x squared is a graph that I know, right? The graph of y equals x squared is this guy. Square root of x is a very common one. Square root of x looks like this. We know the, the, the graph of x cubed. We know the graph of absolute value. Um, x cubed looks like this. Absolute value is like a V shape. We know a lot of them that are very just plain Jane, right? X squared, square root of X, X cubed, absolute value of X. So what I mean whenever I say transformations is I'm going to use one of these graphs that I already know, 
and I'm going to transform it into a new graph. Okay, so that's what I want to um, to um, review right now. So the first thing I'm going to say is let f of x be a known function. So by that I mean one of these guys, a function whose graph we know. Okay, we know those graphs. What I want to know is I want to know how do I graph a function of this form? Don't let this scare you, okay? Y equals C times F of A times X plus B plus D. So what this means is I'm taking a graph I know, that graph right here, and I'm changing it in a lot of ways, okay? I can actually use these graphs I know and just using A, B, C, and D there, I can transform it into this new graph. How I do that is using these steps. The first step, use B to horizontally shift. So shift this known one to the right or to the left. We're going to use B right there. If B is positive, that means we go to the left. So if B is negative, go to the right. Okay, so, so again, we are going to use this B right here and go either to the left or to the right, depending on if B is positive or negative. Step number two. is to horizontally scale it by a factor of the absolute value of A. So horizontally scaling it means I'm going to either stretch it horizontally or compress it. So it's either going to squish it or stretch it out. Okay. If A is negative, then reflect over the Y. Step number two, or sorry, step number three, we just did two. Step number three is to vertically scale it by a factor of the absolute value of C. So vertically, so that means either stretching it vertically, so I grab it and stretch it or compress it by a factor of the absolute value of C. If C is negative, then reflect it over the X axis. And then our last step, step number four, use D, this last D right here, to vertically shift, either shift it up or down. If D is positive, go up. If D is negative, go down. So this is how I take a graph that, that I already know and use it to, to draw a new one, okay? It is a very important thing, and it is a very big deal. You have to do it step one, step two, step three, and step four. It has to be in order just like this. If you switch steps, it will not be the right graph, okay? You have to do it in these exact steps exactly like this. Step one, step two, step three, and then step four, okay? So just be careful there. Let's do some examples of that. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to use this graph side since it's a graph. We're going to draw the graph of the function y equals negative absolute value of x plus 2 minus 3. We're going to draw that graph. y equals 
negative absolute value of x plus 2 minus 3. So first thing is I need to know what graph do I know? Is there a graph inside of this equation that I know? Well, I can see here there are absolute value bars here, right? I know the graph of the absolute value of x is like a v-shape. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that because I know that. This is the graph of the absolute value of x. See if I can draw this straight. Ooh, like that. This is the graph of the absolute value of x. It's a v. That's a graph we already know. So I'm going to do whatever I can to use this graph to draw this one that I don't know. Okay. So our first step, as I wrote down on our four steps, is to horizontally shift it. Okay. Remember, we do that by seeing what is being added to x, x plus b, because it says I want to use b, right? So I, so I see right here, that's x plus b. So I'm going to see what's being added to um, the x. So I see in here, I have x plus 2. So my b is 2, okay? So I know I'm going over two spaces, either to the right 2 or to the left 2, because it's x plus 2. Now notice here, it says if b is positive, we go to the left. So this means I'm going to the left by 2. So 1, 2, and then I'm going to draw the same exact thing. Same shape, same size. I'm just shifting it to the left by 2. Everything else is exactly the same. That's the graph of the absolute value of x plus 2. So I no longer need this graph I had to start with. That was just there to show me where to start. Now I have the graph of the absolute value of x plus 2, which I got by going to the left by 2. So now I move on to step 2, horizontally scale by a factor of the absolute value of a. If a is negative, reflect it. Well, so I see my right here a is what is in front of the x term, okay? Well, if I look in front of the x term, there's nothing there, right? That is an understood 1. It's just 1x. So that actually means I don't have to scale it because I can't scale by a factor of a 1, right? Because it's just a 1. So that is just going to stay. There's no change here on step 2. Step 2, I don't even need it there, okay? Again, because our a is equal to a 1 because it's just 1x, okay? So step number 2, I'm good. Move on to the third step, vertically scale by a factor of the absolute value of c. Well, our c right here is negative and then a 1. So absolute value, absolute value of c is the absolute value of the negative 1, which is just 1, which means I don't have to scale that one too, right? Because it's just a 1, and so that, that will stay. However, it does say if c is negative, reflect it over the x. Since it's negative 1, I am going to reflect it, okay? So now instead of being over here, it's going to reflect and be over there. So now it's going to be over here. Again, because I am reflecting it over the x, which I do that because of the minus sign. So this is the graph of negative absolute value of x plus 2, which I got by reflecting it over the x. So now I no longer need this one. I just used it as a guide. And then my fourth step is to use D to vertically shift. So my D is what's outside right here. It's plus D. Here I see I have minus 3. And so D is equal to negative 3. And it says if D is negative, I go down. So this means I'm going to shift it down by 3. So just go down 3, 1, 2, 3. Same size, same shape, everything. I'm just shifting it down 3. That is the graph of negative absolute value of x plus 2 minus 3. And I no longer need this. It just helped me get there. And there we are. So again, what I did there was I shifted it to the left by 2, reflected it, and then went down by 3. And that's how we get that, that graph right there. <clears throat> As I'm looking at this, I realized I was supposed to reflect it over the x, not over the y. So I kind of messed up there. 
So let's go back a few steps. So sorry about that. Please don't hit me. So it was right here. I was supposed to reflect it over the X. So I was supposed to reflect it down. So it's supposed to be like this. Like that. And then go down three. One, two, three, like this. So it should really look like that. Sorry about that. I kind of messed up. This means I reflect it over the X. So it should have reflected down. Anyway, I fixed it. This is how it should look. Just like that. All right, let's do one more example and then that'll be it for section 1.2. See if I reflect it over the right one this time. This time we're gonna be graphing the graph of y equals three square roots of negative x plus one. Three square roots of negative x plus one. So first things first, again, I'm gonna look in here and see, okay, is there a graph that I know? Well, I see a square root in there, and I know the, 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 the graph of the square root is like this. Uh, square root of zero is zero, square root of one is one, and then I know the square root of four is two, so one, two, three, four, one, two. Square root of nine is three. So I know the graph of the square root of x looks like this. That is the graph of the square root of x. So I'm gonna use that graph, transform it into a new graph, okay? Remember our first step is to use b to horizontally sh shift, right? Well, the b is what I add to x. Well, if I look right here, there's nothing there, right? I don't have like x plus two or, or stuff like that inside of here. So there's no, not a thing I've got to do for step one. I'm good there. I'm good with the first step. So move on to step two. Horizontally scale by a factor of the absolute value of a. Well, a is what's in front of the x. So I have negative x, which means a is equal to negative one, right? So I've got to scale it by the absolute value of negative one, which is one. So I don't actually have to scale it. However, I do see if it is negative, I have to reflect it over the y, which it is right here, right? That means I'm reflecting it over the y. Let's see if I reflect it over the right one this time. Reflect over the y would bring it over here. So that brings this point to right here, this point to right here, that point to right here. So it makes this lovely graph right there. This was the graph of the square root of x. That's the that's a graph that that's a graph that um, we knew, right? And this is the graph of the square root of negative x. So I no longer need this one. I just used it to help me out. So now let's see what I do to to, to this graph. Step three is to vertically scale by a factor of the absolute value of c, and c was what is out front right here, right? So our scale is I'm going to vertically scale it by three. What vertically scaling means is I'm going to multiply every y by three, okay? So it was one right here, so now it's one times three, which is a three. So one, two, three. Now it's right there. Again, because I'm going to multiply every y by three. My y right here was two. Two times three is six. So now I need y equals a six. So that's two, three, four, five, six. Now move on right here. Y was equal to three. Uh, three times three is nine. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's gonna kind of run into my text, but that's okay. So this is the graph of three times the square root of negative X. Again, I just multiplied every Y by three. So now I know all I need this one. That just helped me out. Then my fourth and final step is to use D to vertically sh shift it. Since I have plus one, that, that means I'm just gonna go up by a one. So every point, just move it up one. Move that point up one, this point up one, this point up one, this point up one. So there we have it. That is the graph that I want. So again, what I did right there, my first step, there was no change there. Step number two was to reflect it over the y. Step number three was to multiply every y by three. 
And then our last step was to move up by a one. So there it is. All right, that is the end of what we are going to um, review for section 1.2. And so, again, if any of that did not make sense, make sure you, like, rewind or ask me is a big point. You can always ask me, and I will be happy to, to, to help out. Just let me know, okay? All right, that is it. You may now move on to section 1.3 or go back and re-watch this.